Well, it's always a joy to be part of the church and last few weeks have been hectic weeks and right up till September I've got a hectic travel that's come up. I just arrived this morning and I was, as I was landing at the airport in the early hours of the day, I was wondering, Lord, I'm so exhausted. I'm so tired. Okay. And I wish that my Monday travel would get terminated because I have to leave tomorrow early morning again. And lo and behold, that trip got cancelled and God is a prayer answering God. And I was just thanking God. Sometimes he knows our fatigue and we can talk to him the way we feel and God's provision is very divine. Okay. This morning I want to speak to you on an interesting topic. I'm sure uh, the, the title would be interesting and I hope the stuff interest is also interesting for you. Okay. The question I'm going to ask you is how much is much? Correct. How much is much? Okay. I want you to ponder on this question. How much is actually much? If you would ask a wife or a husband, does she love you or does he love you? He does love me, but not much. Correct? That's the answers most of the wives or the husbands give. Okay? He does take care of me, but not very much. He, he does appreciate me, but not much. So I want to ask you the question, who quantifies how much is much? Who determines that? Is a question that you need to ask this morning. Okay, what is it that quantifies us? Does the Bible really say, is it, is, it, is it much as much? Okay, and I'm going to help you to look at this from three. What quantifies it as much? Who, who, what is it that quantifies this as much? Okay, for example, is one kg biryani much? Or is it a bucket biryani is much? Or buckets of biryani is much? What is it that quantifies it as much? Second guys, when can I say I have much? Okay, when can I say that I have much? Question number three, how do I know I have much? Three questions of my conversation today, looking at God's word. What quantifies it to be much? When can I say I have much? Okay, and how do I know I have much? If I'm able to take you through these three questions, this question gets answered. How much is much? Are you with me? Okay. So look to your neighbor and say, how much is much? Okay. I hope you got an answer. If not, wait for it. The Bible says, I'm going to quote two, two proverbs Solomon wrote. Very well-learned man, man of wisdom. He says, if you find honey, eat just enough, too much of it, and you will, are you with me? Okay. It says if you find honey, eat just enough. Because by mistake, if you eat up more, you will end up vomiting or you have to pump an insulin to vomit it out. Diabetics, correct? Either way, you could fall into a category. The Bible also says in Proverbs 25 verse 27, it is good to eat too much, it is not good to eat too much honey, nor is it honorable to search out matters that are too deep. Correct? Interesting. Okay? It's interesting how Bible brings in too much of things. Now don't go back and tell your wives, pastor said this morning, Honey is good, but too much of honey is you will vomit it. No, no, no. That's not what I'm going to teach you this morning. Okay? That's a wrong interpretation. I'm talking about literal honey. Okay? And Jesus is represented as a honey from the comb. Okay? That's the, that's the best representation of Jesus. He tastes honey. He tastes uh, sweeter than the honey from the rock. Okay? So the Bible gives us both balances. And Solomon, in his conclusion in the book of Ecclesiastes, says, the man of wisdom balances his life. He avoids extremes of anything. Okay, my life, my wife, my wife loves a lot of sweets, but I am not a guy who loves sweets at all. Okay, I just can't have sweets, but I keep telling her eat sweets in a in a in a pattern that you get to eat the sweet till the last day of your life. Don't eat up all at one age that you can't eat later on. Correct? Eat little by little so that you're able to eat sweets right till the last day, healthy 
and fit. Okay, so eating sweets is her part, and keeping her fit is my part. That's the agreement we have made. Okay, and if you find she's fit, thank me. Okay, how much is much is a very important question, and you need to answer this question. Luke chapter twelve, verse forty-seven to forty-eight. I'm going to speak to you. the servant who knows his master's will, and does not get ready, or does not do what his master wants, will be beaten. and will be beaten with few blows for everyone okay for everyone who has been given much much more will be demanded and from the one who has been entrusted with much much more will be asked i think jesus jesus loved this word uh, sorry jesus loved this word much 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 four times four times i think he just loved it to him much is given much is demanded to him who has been entrusted with much more much more will be asked out of him hallelujah okay some of us think the heaven is a place of equality it's not a place of equality it's definitely not a place of equality okay equality does not bring in god's justice it does not bring in god's justice In, if that is the case then every student in respect of what he wrote teacher should give him 100 out of 100 that's not fairness that's not the kingdom principle kingdom principle is god allocates to each one of us a portion which he considers is at much and the bible says when much is given to you much is demanded out of you okay i have i keep talking to my children and i say this in my early years of my studying in my for my early years of raising up i had lot of things that were not much i didn't have a place to stay at home our place wasn't a home of a great peace and order it was a it was a place of great chaos even finding electricity was difficult we had to find uh, uh, lamps to sit and study we never had time to study therefore we had to find time to study and get through our 10th and 11th and 12th we had to find jobs on our own there were no google searches gk books have to be read nothing was nothing was given for us finding an answer was not so easy those days you had to run through shelves and shelves of library meet people ask their request and help them to solve a mathematical problem which today happens at the click of a button that you can get the solution okay much was given and much is demanded okay but as i grew up in my walk with god after met after i met jesus god started to add much more to my life much more to my life and he kept adding and elevating me much to much to much to much to a place of great abundance that's when i decided that's when i decided in my mind wow i've got a fantastic career going about to become so comfortable and settle down in the much provisions of god that i was about to put on my next strength everything was going well highly decorated officer god said to whom much is given much is demanded and that's when i had to leave everything and step out of the navy not knowing where our life will end what is a journey and i remember signing off on the 31st of august and moving in faith trusting god to take us in the five years of our journey god has been a divine provider and his supplier on our journey and his name deserves every glory and every honor and i want to keep you keep keep thinking on this god's standard is he expects more from whom he is given more he expects more okay i remember coming down to bangalore sitting in the adonai church enjoying the nice air conditioner just sitting cooling and as i came out of that that church this is the word god said to whom much is given much is demanded i have not invested these years into your life to enjoy a cozy life but i have invested into you so that you give and build the kingdom to its fullness that's the beginning of our nfc history and the journey of it okay very much i don't know whether whether the bollywood hollywood read the bible but i want to say peter parkin peter parker how many of you know this guy many of you know it okay old generation doesn't know this guy is 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 spider man okay 
a favorite for most of our young guys okay okay he quotes in his in his movie with great power comes great responsibility the famous dialogue of spider man with great power comes great responsibility i think he read luke chapter 12 i guess so at least the director the script writer must have read the bible and he has put this with great power comes great responsibility okay when god gives you authority he expects you also to be responsible in the place of work and that's exactly what jesus said in the previous from the one who has been entrusted more more will be asked of him responsibility will be demanded out of his life okay responsibility will be demand demanded and i'll give you some some simple examples if god has given you the ability to sing he will expect more out of you to be able to lead and if god has given you the ability to play music god will expect you to play music if you're good in finances god will expect you to teach that to the next people if you're good in dressing god will expect good in cooking if you're good in teaching if you're good in maths whatever portion god has given he expects it to be added few weeks back i was having conversation with rama and rama said that he's good in visual we said more is given to you transmit to us and therefore he conducted a quick capsule for our generation okay learn absorb because god has not given it for you to just store it and keep it there because with great responsibility comes with great power comes great responsibility what is the definition of much okay a couple of definitions i've taken out <clears throat> to use much to indicate great intensity when you say much you're talking about great intensity you're talking about great extent or a degree of something such as an action feeling or a change that's what is much much is usually used with so to very and also in negative clauses with this meaning okay she laughs too much correct thank you very much okay my hairstyle hasn't changed much since i was five some of the illustrations of how we use the word much okay we use the word much very very often but this is how the definition of the word much appears it is also used in the adverb in its if uh, if something does not happen much it does not happen very often that's the meaning of it correct she doesn't come to church much what does it mean that means that person doesn't okay so that's 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 what that's what you meant by saying that okay he said his father never talked much about the war that means he's never it's the adverb okay gwen had not seen her daddy all that much because mostly he worked on ships agreed okay did you did you get back east much is a framers that we ask in mariners okay did you get east much which means are you getting back to the shores are you getting back to the sunrise is a phrase that we normally use back as back as mariners so these are some of those phrases of the words that we use the word much jesus used in one sentence four times the much okay and he kept reiterating that demanding is always much and i'm going to emphasize on a conversation what quantifies much i ran through the bible as god's beginning of journey and i read to you this morning from exodus chapter uh, uh, 1 corinthians second corinthians chapter 8 right up to exodus chapter 16 verse 15 which talks about god began his journey with the israelites as slaves a bunch of slaves were picked up and god rescued them from all their agony and anxiety and gave them much much but in their in their in their greed some of them tried to gather more and some of them had little left but god ensured that each one had as much as they wanted to have in his provision god does that consciously paul says that in act in acts chapter 2 8 in his conversation he says that he says that god determines how much time and how much space you occupy on the earth god determines If you're staying in a one BHK, two BHK, three BHK, he has determined how much time you'll stay there and for how long. He determines. If some of you think my life is going to end in the one BHK, no. God is a progressive God. If you're faithful with what God has given, little more will be given. Me and Suni began our journey 
okay, in a small house. Okay, that was the roads on which we have walked. We had slept on a borrowed mattress. We have slept on a borrowed bed. Bed, bed of the mattress also was not ours. Early years of our married life, okay. We lived in those days of faithfulness and God added as we were faithfully hosting people and kept our home open for people to enjoy the lavishness of God's goodness, we saw God bringing in much. What quantifies much? Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, godliness with contentment is much. The word used is great, great grain. ESV translation says is very much. Great, much profit. Okay, Godliness with contentment is much gain. Much gain. Godliness with contentment. Okay, And therefore, godliness is God-centered life. It grows not through the pursuit of a process, but through the presence of a person whose name is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Godliness grows not because you have followed the rhythms of the church or a certain process of a church. Godliness comes by a person, by a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. And Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.16, the mystery of godliness is Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16, the mystery, the wonderful mystery of godliness is Jesus Christ. Coming from a Brahmin background, I never understood this mystery till I met Jesus. February 26, 1991. I found the mystery was only in the Vedas. It's not in the Vedas. The mystery is in the person of Jesus Christ. And the day you enjoy that mystery, you are great much. Great much. And godliness is not a process-driven pursuit. It's not something that you get up in the morning and read the Bible. That is not godliness. It's not that you just get down and start praying. That's not what. Coming to church is not a process. All these are rhythms of godliness. But the centerpiece of godliness is through a person. And the mystery is knowing Jesus Christ. Knowing Jesus, the oneness, the fullness of his incarnation, understanding of Jesus Christ sets you free to start seeing life in a different perspective. Okay, in a perspective. Jesus, the biggest guru, the mega guru, the sub guru, made a fantastic statement. He didn't tell his disciples, go into the world, now that you accepted me, your life is going to change. He didn't say that. He said, my friends, my disciples, what they did to you, what they did to me, they will do to you. But he said, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. I have. You will have difficulties in certain times. You will have financial struggles. You will have health issues. You will have issues with stress. You will have issues with certain things not functioning in your body. It doesn't matter what is the centerpiece of your life is. Are you content? Are you content in what you are? Our most quoted phrase is this. My God shall supply all my riches according to his glory. My God shall supply. Okay, and that, that, that I can do all things through Christ, Philippines 4. Okay, fantastically Christian scored. All of us scored these verses. Paul wasn't talking in a place of abundance. He's talking about his times of need and difficulty. And this is what Paul is saying. I know the previous verses. I know what it is to have empty bank balances. I know what it is to open a wallet and see there is nothing in that. I know what it is to go and see a bad, horrifying medical report. But in those situations and also in the seasons of abundance, I can do all things through Christ because that is the mystery of godliness. That is the mystery of godliness. Enjoying Jesus is a centerpiece of godliness. I disciple young couples and I put them on tight regime on their finances. Some of them I've asked them to even open envelopes so that they're careful in handling what finances. Are they going to live that like that throughout their life? The answer is no. If they've learned the stewardship in that small, God will start to entrust to them the treasures of heaven. That's what Jesus said. If you don't know how to handle the earthly treasures, who will entrust into your hands the treasures of he heaven? Who will give to you? Little faithfulness. 
godliness. Okay? What quantifies much? This quantifies much. The litmus test of your life is, are you content? Are you content in your marriage? Are you content in your children? Are you content with your own life with Christ Jesus? Are you content with your work? Are you content with the way you spend your day? Are you content with the church? Are you content with your relationships? Are you content with your neighbors? Are you content with the season that God is taking you through? Are you content to the fullness of knowing the mystery of Jesus Christ? Answer these questions, my friends. That quantifies much. If your answer to all this is yes, then I want to tell you, you have much. You have much. You have very, very, very much. You need to find contentment because godliness with contentment is great gain. And when you look at this perspective, you will find the errors of people become insignificant and you start to see bigger things that God has in their life. Okay, let me give you some examples. You will start seeing children as a blessing. You don't see them as something that is you have to struggle with. Okay, when children go today morning, we sang that gracious song. Even if I fall thousand times, Lord, your grace gets behind me. Hallelujah. Okay, and I can tell you this with all confidence. If you have prayed for your children, you prayed for your children, God is faithful to see your prayer answered. He will not let your hair go down in grave. You will not see the decay of your bones before you see the deliverance of the Lord. God is faithful. Start to find contentment in God. Find your identity in Jesus. Stick to him. Hang around him. Do things that keep you connected to Jesus Christ. Do something, plug into him, find opportunities, meet people, discuss people, talk about church, talk about Christ. He loves church. Discuss those things because the mystery of godliness is all there. Okay? Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is much great. Okay? He appeared in the body, was vindicated in the spirit was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and now taken up in glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 The mystery of godliness. This is our Jesus. Okay? He was, he was seen physically in body. He appeared to his people. He was vindicated on the cross for your sins. Vindicated. Father disowned him. Okay, He was seen by angels. He was preached into the nations. Today, gospel has reached to me, a devout Brahmin, because Jesus has preached. Hallelujah. Okay, was believed in the, on in the world and was taken up in glory. And he's coming back again, my friends. That's the mystery of Jesus Christ. If you're assured of this confidence, you will find that you have much. You have much. You start to see everything in the life of Jesus Christ. Your marriage becomes exciting. Your children become exciting. Your work becomes exciting. I travel about 22 days in a month. Sometimes most of my journey is in the flight. And as I fly through the skies, I can crumble, I can crib. But I, 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 I remember last travel, Suni traveled with me and we both in the flight. And I was reading to her, I, uh, Isaiah, 30, Isaiah 20, Isaiah 20, 29, I was reading with her loudly in the aircraft, aloud. Others are listening and I'm reading. I was so fascinated with the Hezekiah's prayer. And as I look through the skies, I can see the wondrous thing of what a majesty that I have in contentment and godliness. You find yourself hiding, fully satisfied. And therefore, when I come back, home is a place of great peace. Church is a place of great peace. Relationships are a place of great peace. Life itself is a place of great peace. Because Jesus is a mystery of all that. Okay? Take a decision today. Who are you? Where are you? What quantifies much? Godliness with contentment quantifies much. When can I say I have much? When can I say I have much? There were two people in the Bible. One is called the rich fool. The other one was called the wise man. Okay? The rich fool said he had a lot of wealth. I think he had got double bonus, triple bonus, 
good returns he had got and he didn't know what to do with the amount of abundance that has come. But this is what he said loudly. Okay? That is not that he said it in his heart. He stood. The Greek version of that verse is he stood on a high tall place and then he said, this is what I will do. That's how he said it. Okay? I will tear down my bonds and build the bigger ones. How is it translated today? I will sell off this house and I will buy a bigger house. I will dispose this phone and I'll buy an iPhone. I will dispose my car and I'll buy a bigger car. That's what he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. Hallelujah. I wonder how much will he eat in his entire lifetime. Correct? But the abundance, he said, my grain and my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Hallelujah. That's how he called it as much. I have got a lot of things. Some of us may not have bonds, but we have securities in which we constantly build our confidence. It could be our bank balances. It could be our savings. It could be our good financial investments. It could be something, a job. It could be something in your life that you are so secured and that security cannot be tampered. We say that when the first thing, when, a naval, when we joined the National Defense Academy, the first thing for an officer is to buy a good bike. That's what a Fauji is all about. Fauji is all about a bike, a good bike. And every morning he will clean the bike. And sooner or later, okay, you will find that the other person has entered, his wife has entered the, entered his life. Now he's, he's, in a, he's always in a debate, bike or wife. Correct? What is, what is, but I know some of my batchmates, they say that, but if I ask, if you ask a batchmate, if you bike, then I can take it. You can take bike, don't ask Take everything. Now sometimes I ask them, everything includes what? Includes wife, children, everybody? Everything you because his security is in that. His confidence, his whole identity is in that. Not that you should, you should not take care of your property, but security remains. And such kind of security, the Bible calls it rich fool. What does it say? Rich fool. You are rich, but yet a fool. That's the word the Bible uses. You are a rich fool because the conversation goes on. And Jesus uses a beautiful, he says, tonight, tonight, you don't wake up. Tonight, if you don't get up, what is going to happen to your plans, man? Tonight, life is in my hands, God says, Jesus. Tonight, you don't get up. That's a rich fool. There's also a wise man. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. Why did he hide it? He didn't want to lose it. After years of relationship, he found it. He didn't want to lose it. Okay? And then, in his joy, how did he go? In joy. Normally, if you hide something, how will you go? Tension. Will it remain? Have you hidden anything? I'm sure some of you have stolen money from your dads and moms like me. Correct? And we hide it underneath. In my zamana, we used to hide it in the mud near the tree. Used to have some things, correct? You've hidden, but always with tension. But this guy didn't go with tension, man. He went with joy. And people must have asked him, Why are you joyful? And he's saying, I found something and I've hid it, man. I hid it. That's how he must have had conversation. Went with great joy. He went away, and what did he do? He went and sold everything. And he said, My goodness, I'm not going to lose this. I am not going to lose this. I got it and I'm going to, and he bought it. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for pearls. When he found one of the great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Hallelujah. I like the, like the, so when can I say much? Both have a lot. One has a precious pearl. One has wealth and security. But one is called a rich fool. One is called a wise man. Okay? What is the difference in this, in both of it? The interesting thing is this. Both had the priorities mixed up. One had the right priority. One had the wrong priority. 
the rich fool was selfish. Was selfish. He was only looking after myself, my wife, my children, my dog, and my house. But the wise man purchased a precious field because he knew what I have discovered in God will be a blessing for many people. Do you know the story of the two lepers when the Armenians attacked the nation of Israel? There was a huge scarcity for food and the overnight God strikes them and the whole campsite get disappeared and these two blind beggars were going around on that, on, that, on that place and suddenly they discover something and they find something and what do they do? They had an option of keeping it all for themselves but they left and came back and said, my goodness, we found something and that is for all of us. And that's how they opened up. We have a mentality like the Alibaba and the 40 thieves. How many of you know that Alibaba story? Kulja? Very good. So you know, correct? Kulja Simpson, correct? We have an attitude like an Alibaba. That is the attitude of a rich fool. But a wise man looks for the benefit of another person. What you did this morning as an exercise is an expression of being wise to refresh people into their, into their spheres of life. Okay? Are you with me, my friends? Take a call today who you want to be, a rich fool or a wise man. Call is yours. Okay? You need to put what is there in the right investment and the right priority because when your priorities are for the kingdom, I can tell you, write it down in a piece of paper. God is no man's debtor. I have never seen God not settling your scores. He transfers graciously. Somewhere, God will be a provider. And I have ample witnesses in this church who have experienced the graciousness of God when you have been obedient and given to the Lord wholeheartedly. Okay? Being wise and being rich is a decision which you can control. You can control that decision. Don't spiritualize the decision. Don't make it so holy that you have to pray for 40 days. No, no, no. It's a decision that you can control. It is your decision to control. You can take a decision and you can very much control to be a rich fool or a wise man. Jesus told a story of a wise builder and a foolish builder. Remember my friends, both build their houses. Did you know that? Both got the occupancy certificate. Did you know that? Both got the occupancy certificate, which means both moved into the houses. Both were living comfortable. When they were living comfortable, the foolish builder must have looked at the wise builder and said, Are guy, what a waste of money, man. So much of money you spent on building on the rock. I saved so much of money. Look how much of money is there in my bank balance. They must have had some kind of conversations, correct? Which both had occupancy certificate, both did the registration of their houses, and both moved into their houses. But Jesus said this, life is never a two-minute instant noodle. With life, as time progresses, your decisions will tell you whether your decision is right or decision is bad. And Jesus said, the foundations of life are not for good times, they're from bad times. Jesus said when the storm came, when the rain came, when troubles came, the house on the rock stood firm. But the house on the sand collapsed. Are you with me, my friends? Okay. Both built, both lived. For the temporarily you may feel good, the other guy has saved money. But I want to say, shortcuts are never going to take you to life. We have a nice saying in the Navy. Always choose the harder right than the easier wrong. Harder right than the easier wrong. Choose the harder way. My friends, young people, if you don't know the answer, leave the answer in the examination. Don't copy it. Choose the harder right than the easier wrong. Because in the life, as life progresses, you will see the decisions that you made. God will be no man's debtor and he will start to settle scores with you. Are you with me? Yeah? How do I know I have much? Very important question. There's only one answer to that question. Your heart testifies. Who testifies? Your heart testifies. I know what it is to be in need. For I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. 
I've learned the secret of being content in, a, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Philippines 4.12. Hallelujah. Okay. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Who testifies? Okay. Who testifies this? Your heart testifies. Let me read a nice story for you sent by one of my friends. Okay. I'm sure some of you must have got it on the WhatsApp. A lady was about 90 years old. She had a great flair towards dressing up very well. Do you remember anybody else like that in our church? Yeah. She has a great flair for dressing up extremely well. She, she comes so beautifully applying the correct combination, earrings, stones, everything is so beautifully arranged. And even her hairstyle had beautiful patterns. I know some of you are looking at your wives. Yes, praise God. Okay. She and her husband have been married to each other for 70 years. After the departure of her husband, beloved partner, having no children and no one in the family to take care of her, she decided to move into a nursing home, old age home. Even on the day when she vacated a good, enormous, lavish apartment, which was good, she dressed up eloquently, looked gorgeous at 90, looked really gorgeous. Okay? After arriving at the nursing room, she waited patiently at the lobby for a couple of hours for the room to be made ready for the young dynamic lady to move into that okay she was all excited not a word of grumble not a word of murmur she sat quietly through this conversation when the attendant finally helped her to make her way to the room the attendant made all efforts to prepare this eloquently dressed woman to tell her that the room does not have such a visual des description it's a very tiny place which she was about to occupy she spent a sizable amount of time preparing Mrs. Jones. Okay? Mrs. Jones, you haven't yet seen the room, but the room is very small. It's not. It's just, just enough for an elderly woman like you. And the response of Mrs. Jones was this. I love it! The lady expressed with enthusiasm, like an eight-year-old kid who got a puppy for the first time. That's how she expressed. I love it. Well, she says, Mrs. Joan, you haven't seen the room yet. Just wait. They didn't enter remark. Just wait, just wait. Don't hold your remarks. Okay. Well, my joy has nothing to do with the room, the lady replied. My joy has nothing to do with the room. Whether I like my room or not doesn't depend on how the furniture is arranged. It depends on how I have arranged my mind. It depends on arranged my mind. Happiness is something that you can decide ahead of time you can decide to be ahead of time and i've already decided to love my room i've decided to love my people around me i've decided to my love my life the way i am it's a decision that i make every morning when i wake up and you know what the greatest asset we all have is the power to choose to be happy or grumpy you have the power to choose it. Today morning you can get up and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Or you can make a decision like this 90 year old lady. It doesn't matter what the room is. I have enjoyed life in season and out of season. Like Paul, I have learned the secret of being content. The lady continued to speak and the attendant listened to this lady attentively, attentively with her mouth wide open. Shocked. I can spend my entire day in the bed thinking of the pain I'm going through, focusing on the parts of my body that no longer work. Or I can get out, of med, get out of my bed and be thankful for those parts that do work. Each day is a gift. And as long as my eyes are still open, I will continue to focus on God. And today, and the, all the happy memories that I've already stored up in my mind just for this time in my life. Hallelujah. The attendant was astounded by the positive attitude of this elderly woman whose life was from an external perspective of view only was full of problems and hopelessness. It changed. Conclusion says this, my friend. Only problems happen automatically. Happiness is a choice we all have to make. Okay? Hatred comes automatically. Love is a choice. We all make. Being negative happens automatically. But being positive is a choice 
that we complaining is automatic gratitude is a choice that we all have to make how much or how do i know i have got much your heart testifies to that you know what jesus said a fantastic statement from the abundance of your heart the mouth speaks from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks if you are cynical your heart is filled with strife if you are complaining your heart is filled with depression if you are constantly murmuring your heart is filled with dissatisfied if you are constantly using phrases of negativity you have stored in garbage therefore you are constantly bringing out garbage replace them replace them be filled with gratitude thank god for what god has given thank god for what i i i i, I like suni's response in the early years of my naval life i traveled out of 365 days i would travel 311 days i would sail for 311 days so how many days left for her to see me she would sail but i really thank god for those years we took a decision instead of complaining of the 311 days can we make use of the days that we have got okay i travel now also quite frequently and me and suni always think let's make use of the time that we have rather than the time that we don't have okay it's a choice you can decide today god has given me much god has given me much and your heart will testify that god has given you much god is gracious my friends to you many times death could have swallowed you many times you could have been hit by a road accident many times you could be in the list of the people who did not qualify for the interviews and jobs you could be one of those people who could be accused of a scam you could be one of those people whose children could be murdered kidnapped or trafficked you could be one of those people whose marriages are involved in promiscuity you could be one of those people where your home is not a place of great satisfaction but thank god that you are in the place of god's protection and god's favor it's time for you to be thankful time for you to be thankful you should thank god that your children go to school and come back without being abused without being mistreated without thank god million things are there to say that god has given you much much there is table on your food god provides to you food he has never left you hungry god's provisions are there be thankful and you will find god adding much to your life things will turn around who how do i know your heart tell your neighbor my heart knows how much is god's provision okay let me take you the keys of much experience if you are a person who is experiencing much this is how anybody will be able to see it three keys i can give you one okay you could either be a steward or a slave you could be a steward or a slave if you are a person god gives you much you could turn up to be a good steward of god's provision sorry you could be a good steward of god's provision okay or you could be a slave to your problems okay peter says in 1 peter chapter 4 10 he says as each has received a gift use it to serve one another as good stewards of god's varied grace of god's varied grace wide variety of grace has been given to us use it as god's stewards use it as god's stewards when you use it as god's stewards you are enjoying the experience of much if you are not doing it then you are living like a slave like a slave and proverbs 19 says laziness brings on deep sleep and an idle soul will suffer hungry i do not know how many of you how many of you experience this you know the bible says in the book of proverbs better is a sleep of the laborer whether he eats little or whether he eats much you know what the more comforts have come more difficult it has become people to attend to the commitments do you know that okay the more comfortable bed you have the more less sleep you get did you know that okay it's interesting it's interesting the more comfortable people have become i know of people who didn't have a bike they were able to come to church on time but they got a bike and a car problems increased okay because you know what you become a slave to the much you become a slave you become such a slave 
that you like the comfort and you become lazy and it brings on deep sleep and an idle soul will soon suffer hunger. Comfort makes you a slave. Slave. And I know, what did you do the whole day? Sleeping. What did you do the whole day? Just lying down on the bed. Just lying down on the bed. Laziness can bring in hunger upon your life. You are a slave to the comforts. But a good steward, a good steward is a steward who waits on the master. That's what Jesus said. When the master comes, he opens the door, is always awake through the watches of the night, not physically awake, alert and quick and fast. Okay? Think. If God has given you lavish, lavish clothes, lavish dresses, people become late because they're not able to decide in the wardrobe which one to wear. But the guy who's got one pair has no problem. He's always on time. Wahi juta hai, wahi panta, wahi shirt hai, pan kya jayega? But itna combination mein time chala jata hai. Correct? Am I right? Maximum wars are not world wars. They happen on a Sunday morning. Correct? Powerful than World War II, World War I. Correct? Biggest wars are fought at home. Why? Because some of us are fallen into this category. I'm not saying that you're a physical slave, but think. Think. Are you a steward? If God has given you a good vehicle, are you a steward or are you a slave? If God has given you a good resource, are you a steward or are you a slave? Okay? If God has given you a good job, are you a steward or are you a slave? Because the provision of God comes from the living God. Laziness brings on deep sleep. You know what? It doesn't take, it doesn't take to be lousy and slousy. It doesn't take much time. You don't need to do a PhD or a study. Okay? You can, be, you can just be like a slot that can just sleep off anywhere. Sleeping, sleeping. That's because when much has come, you started to become a slave to the much. Soon you will find your heart is full of hatred. It is full of bitterness. It doesn't have words of life and you're constantly struggling. Okay? Second key. Okay? You could end up as a person who praises God or you can end up as a person who is proud and arrogant. Correct? You can end up both with much. Okay? You should be a person who praises God rather than being proud about what God has given to you. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, man. Every good and perfect gift. What is that is so good in your life? Tell me. What is it that's so good? Is it your gold chain, your diamond, your, your gold, whatever is there, your bike, your car, your house? What is that good? If you want to go back, that good comes from above. The father of lights. Okay? Coming down from the father heavenly lights with whom there is no change and no shifting shadows. It doesn't change at all. Hallelujah. He's not a sifting shadow. But God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. I was telling my children the same James, J, the book of James. I was telling illustration. The Greek illustration, Jesus, the Bible says in the book, in the book of James, it says, God resists the proud and lifts the humble or carries the humble. You know, this is the beauty about that illustration. So, Am I just come here? Okay. Like for example. Okay, Maima wants to push me. Okay, assume Maima is a small girl. Like, assume that she is the age of Emeth. Okay, and she is pushing. Let her push. This is proud. What is she doing? Oppose. Oppose, Maima. Push, push, push. Can you see? Has God changed? Push, push, Maima, push. Has God changed? It remains the same. God opposes the proud. How does he oppose? He just remains. God, you're not good. You've not given me this. You're not given me. See that? My push. You're not given me this. You're not given me this. God is standing there. Ah. Push. But the Greek version says, God lifts the humble. You know what it is? When she comes in humility. God, I really need this breakthrough. I've been battling upon this. I can't handle it. I cannot cross this mountain. You know what is this? He carries her. 
This is to the other side. He just carries her. God opposes the proud, but lifts the humble. Hallelujah. When you come in humility, God knows your heart. God understands how you feel. God knows you need it. God knows your breakthrough. Not a tear of yours, he doesn't know. And when you come to him in humility, he will lift you up and carry you to the other side, safe to the shore. Because he knows you've come in humility. When God has given you much, my friends, come to him in humility. Come to him with a humble heart. God is not a person who doesn't understand us. He knows us very well and he understands our feeling. Okay? I told you this morning, I told God in the aircraft, Lord, so tired I am. Don't worry. And God did create a riot in Puri because of which I cannot travel. Okay? God makes ways when you come to him in humility. But in pride I could have said, no problem God, I'll go. That is pride. When you talk to him in humility, he carries you. He carries you to the other side. And he brings you to that place. Okay? That's what the rich fool did not know how to respond to the much. He responded in pride. And God said, tonight I take your life. Okay? Principle number three. You can either test God or you could be a true worshipper with a much. Okay? Satan is known to have much. He was one of the best musicians. The choir leader of the heaven. Next in the order of hierarchy. So much so, the book of Jude says, the archangel Michael, while negotiating for the body of Jesus Christ. Archangel Michael is a cinemos leader. Cinemos angels mentioned in the Bible. Okay? Wanted to rebuke Satan, but did not rebuke Satan, but said, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. Which means he was senior in hierarchy. Satan is senior in the hierarchy of the archangels. He is a fallen angel. Chief choir leader. He had much, but he tested God. And he tested Jesus and asked Jesus also. He said, worship me. Test, test. And Jesus responded to Satan. With the much that God has given me, I do not put my God to test anymore. I don't test my God anymore. I don't need to test God anymore. Because God is good in the content. And Jesus also said, beautifully in John chapter, but a time is coming and has come when a generation of true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such as those to worship Him in God, worship Him. God is a spirit and His worshippers must worship Him in truth. Hallelujah. When God has given you much, your heart just overflows with gratitude. It just overflows with gratitude. You just come to a place of just lavishly giving back to his kingdom. Because he's given you so much, my brothers. So much is given. So your heart turns to be true worshippers. Okay? When you have experienced much of Jesus, you turn to be a true worshipper. Okay? Like the woman who broke the alabaster jar. Like the woman who put the coins into the, into the offering bag. Okay? Like that woman who was bleeding for 18 years who touched the cloak of Jesus. God transformed. Like the beggar that came back. Like the, like the leper that got healed and came back. Came back with a gratitude heart. It just came back with gratitude. That is true worshipers. That is true worship. Being part of worship service is a heart of gratitude. You don't come to worship service because you feel good. You come here filled with so much of gratitude for the six days that God has given you that you just want to overflow in your heart of gratitude. Okay? And therefore Paul says this, I beat my body and I make it a slave to righteousness so that I don't fall short of being a worshiper of Jesus Christ. Three keys. You can end up as a slave or a steward. You could end up as a person who praises or a person who's proud. Or you could test God. Or you could turn up to be a true worshipper of God. Okay? As I conclude, three questions for you this morning. 
What are you doing with the much that God has given you? What are you doing? Think about it. Okay? Check your heart and seek him in humility. God opposes the proud but lifts the humble and carries them to the other side. Okay? Don't say he has not blessed me enough. Don't say that. God gives to each one of us a portion of what we need and he's allocated to all of us gifts according to each one of us. That's what the Bible says. When he ascended to heaven, he scattered the gifts abroad to all of us according to what he has apportioned to us. Your time and space on the earth is ordained by God. You can go out of this room this evening as a transformed person and to say that I am a person of much grace, much favor, much goodness. Or I can go out of this room saying that life is so miserable. You can go out of this room like the 90 year old woman who decided in her mind that room doesn't decide my happiness. I have decided by the attitude that is deep down in my heart. I want to close with these three questions. Take a minute. Answer them within yourself. And I'm going to close this afternoon in prayer. Father, we thank you for sometimes our heart has deceived us. Our heart has become a murmuring and a complaining heart. Our heart has never learned to be content. We ask you this afternoon to forgive those times that we have wandered away with a rebellious and a proud heart. As we sang this morning, change my heart, O oh Lord. I want to look to you this afternoon. Change our hearts. Our hearts need your intervention and your finger touch. Help us this afternoon, Lord, to relook at our lives. Help us to be people of great gratitude, like the church in the Corinth that Paul commended them for. I pray this afternoon each one of our names will be a pleasing to your sight thank you that you've given us so much thank you for our jobs thank you for our families thank you for our marriages thank you Lord for our our ability to travel thank you for our good health thank you for our parents thank you for all the members of the church Thank you for each one of them and the value that they bring to our lives. We pray this afternoon, help us to be a family that will always be good stewards of your resources. We will always be people who will praise Jesus all the days of our life. And we will be true worshippers of the living God. I want to thank you. And I want to bless you for this opportunity to look at God's word and refresh our hearts this afternoon, Father. In the name of Jesus, we ask you to forgive us and give us another leash of life to be filled with gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.